You're listening to the Music Tech Teacher Podcast, episode number 41. Welcome to the Music Tech Teacher Podcast. Music tech tips, lesson ideas, advice, news and interviews, especially for music teachers. Brought to you by midnightmusic.com.au. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Music Tech Teacher Podcast. I'm Katie Wardrobe, a music technology education trainer, speaker and consultant from midnightmusic.com.au where I help music teachers use technology effectively in music education. In this episode, I talk with Christopher Sutton, who discovered a fascination for ear training quite some time into his own personal journey as a musician. Realising that there are many other people who also need help developing their inner musician, he created an online community and learning environment called Musical You. And he also has his own podcast called The Musicality Podcast. As usual, you can find the links to all of the things that we talk about on the show notes page for this episode at midnightmusic.com.au forward slash 41. I hope you enjoy our chat. My guest today is the founder and director of Easy Ear Training, a London-based music education technology company. He originally trained as a computer scientist and spent some time as a music software developer working in university research and industry R&D. He founded Easy Ear Training in 2009 to help musicians develop their ear for music and over the past eight or more years he's created iOS apps, ebooks, articles, tutorials and more. A couple of years ago, he started a website and online community called Musical You, which is dedicated to helping musicians develop their inner inner musician. He is a huge fan of oats and very nearly started a blog all about porridge. Please welcome Christopher Sutton. Hi, Christopher. How are you? Hi, Katie. Thank you so much for having me on the show. (laughs) Not a problem. I love the bit about oats because I love oats too. I think they are part of my breakfast every single day in some form or another. So it's porridge in winter, but um, we we have a lot of smoothies in our house here and oats go Mm. into our smoothies and that makes it really filling. (laughs) <laughs> so, and then par- um, not porridge. Uh, what do you call it? Muesli. That's the other thing as mm. well. Muesli. So, that's hilarious. Fantastic. Yeah, I, <laughs> I I remember reading. Uh, you told me that you take uh, very nice pictures of your oats and you know the porridge in the morning and so on. So, but the the blog fell away. Did it? The porridge blog. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I. I am a huge advocate and fan of oats in all shapes and forms, but the idea of a porridge blog. It was actually a, probably a slightly painful period in my entrepreneurial journey. <laughs> um, it, it genuinely came out of me stopping probably four or five years ago to ponder whether I was on the right trajectory and whether <laughs> the company I was building was ever going to go anywhere. And I stopped and I kind of asked myself, you know, what else am I passionate about? What could I get this enthusiastic about building a business around? And nothing really came close to music and ear training. But the one thing that did make the list was oats. And so I, I, I gave some serious consideration to whether I could uh, build a business around a porridge blog. <laughs> it's really funny because, you know, like me, you are working for yourself, running your own business and the entrepreneurial world is, it's a really tough journey a lot of the time, I think. And you're constantly checking whether what you're doing is actually going to earn money. And so I can imagine you would have probably done some research into keywords and, you know, whether oats was going to cut the, <laughs> cut it, so to speak. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And, I, you know, I was doing my keyword analysis. I wrote several <laughs> blog posts with SEO in mind. I took photos that I thought would do well on social media. And the bottom line was, I think, the money wasn't going to be there. Like I could definitely have a very fun and maybe even successful porridge blog, but I found it hard to imagine the products I could sell to other porridge enthusiasts. (laughs) Yeah, You know, beyond a wooden spurtle or two, there really isn't much you need to be enthusiastic about oats. So uh, (laughs) Yeah, yeah. it's so true. And oats is not a very high-priced product too. That's also, I I guess, uh, one of the main things (laughs) too. But um, your decision to like do the online business thing um, went – when did you decide to kind of go it alone with that? Because I know you were working for some other people in the past and you must have made a decision at some point to go it alone or was that decision thrust upon you, <laughs> you know, like because, you know, a job ended like that was for me, a job ended and so I was like, okay, what do I do next? Mm, well, it was definitely uh, 
voluntary decision, but I guess it was thrust upon me in the sense that it wasn't something I had planned to do or aimed to do. I, as you mentioned, you know, my background's in technology and I was on a fairly successful career path in audio R&D and doing interesting technology development for a startup company in Cambridge. And I just kind of got sidetracked by this passion for ear training, which I discovered very late in my musical life and a hobby project snowballed a bit. I had more success with an iOS app that I put out than I had expected to. And in particular, I made a bit of money with it, which I hadn't really expected to. (laughs) And for the first time, I kind of looked at it and thought, well, maybe there, maybe there could be a business here and considered the potential of going into business for myself. And from there, I had a relatively easy journey in the beginning part in the sense that I was able to phase out of my day job, going part time, working from home a bit, having a bit of flexibility so that it wasn't kind of a a brave leap of faith that I had to instantaneously make the decision. Um, And so I think probably over the course of a year or so, I went from working full time for a company to working full time for myself. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I want to get I want to get more into sort of the ear training part and what you're doing now, but just on the iOS app uh, side of things, it's funny over the years, like especially when iPads and um, iPhones first came out, I used to get asked a lot of questions because I'm often the go-to person, you know, with music technology questions in mind for people and lots of people were asking me, oh, I've got a great idea for an app. How do I go about, you know, developing one? Or do you know someone? Or what's the process? And I think there was a sense um, for a while, maybe not so much now because I think it's dropped off, but I think there was a sense for a while that it was a fairly easy thing to do and it was going to rake in all this money really quickly. (laughs) So I'd love to know because I know you've worked on multiple apps now. Tell us about the process for that, like what's involved and, you know, do you do a lot of the development yourself or do you have people doing stuff for you? And is it a massive job like I think it probably is? Tell us more about that. Sure. It's a bit like asking how long is a piece of string or how long does it take to write a book or build a building? You know, it's all in the details and you can literally make an app in a day, even if you're not technically minded. There are platforms and courses out there now to help you do that. But the reality is if you want it to be a good app and if you're being ambitious about what the app can do, obviously it's going to take a lot longer. And I think the other thing to mention is there was kind of a gold rush and a lot of hype around apps for actually around the time I was starting my company. And we probably had a bit more success because of that than we would if we launched the same app today. You know, there was less competition. There was a lot of opportunity to do something for the first time. And that meant there were a lot of stories in the press about these overnight successes that brought in, you know, tens of thousands of dollars for a happy app developer who only, <laughs> you know, put it together in two days. Uh, but at the same time, that's not representative. You know, it, there are some horrifying figures, particularly now, but even back then, in the sense that, you know, I'm, I'm going to make it up, but it, it's not far off to say that 80% of apps never get downloaded more than 50 times. Yes. You know, there is such a plethora of apps out there. We're talking millions that the chances of your app getting exposure, getting success and making you some money are actually pretty small. And I think we had some fortune in the early days that we made a good app at the right time. And that brought in money that was enough to convince me to to really dedicate effort to it. Yeah. But it's definitely not, I don't think it was ever, but it's definitely not now the case that you can just throw together an app and have an overnight success and make a lot of money. Unfortunately, that's that's not the reality. It's gone. <laughs> so, yeah, to, I mean, to, to give you a concrete idea, I think the first app we put out that I mentioned, Relative Pitch, that was an interactive interval ear training app. So it's, you know, playing you a perfect fourth and asking you, was that a fourth or a fifth and and that kind of thing. And that was kind of a probably a six week project for me as the solo developer doing pretty much everything myself, just evenings and weekends to get the first version out there. And that, you know, I mentioned it's a hobby project. That was what it was. It was a month and a half. I just kind of put it together and that was enough to get it on the app store in a decent form. By comparison, a few years later, um, sing true, which is our interactive tutor for helping people learn to sing in tune. That's a much more sophisticated app. It's doing audio processing. It's kind of gamified. It has some kind of intelligent coaching to help you through it. And that was probably two thirds of my time for four months, maybe. Um, and I forget what year it was, maybe 2013, 2014, maybe. And so you're talking three months of one person working full time to put together an app like that. 
And it's definitely something you can outsource. I think I'm always a bit cautious to recommend that to people because I think you need a certain degree of tech savviness to manage a developer yeah. and to be able to even spec it out for them. Yeah, I totally so, agree. I think I, I found that found that even over the years with um, things like website development and stuff. Like because I did everything in myself in the early days. I knew then how to talk to a website developer and, and I knew what websites were capable of or what should happen or what should not happen and why, you know, why things were going wrong and just say, can you just fix that? But yeah, you're right, knowing about it. And I think, I think that's the thing that worries me with, you know, someone coming and saying, I've got a great idea for an app. It's kind of like you need to have it, maybe a technical person alongside you even if they're not going to do the work to just sort of translate and talk the talk and stuff. Yeah, and I think that's part of the curse of those early news stories around apps was it gave everyone the sense that you just need a good idea. And I guess that's true in business in general. People think, you know, if only I'd had the idea for Facebook, I could be a billionaire. And the reality is it's partly the idea, it's partly the implementation or the execution, you know, actually getting it done. And it's partly the marketing and are you going to get out there and get it the exposure it needs? Because I learned the hard way that just building a good thing is not enough. You no. know? In my heart, I'm a product creator and I wish it was enough to just make it an amazing product. But that sadly is not the case. Yeah, it's so true. And I think the other thing that the thing that I warn people if they're going to go down this road is that it actually doesn't stop. It only barely starts when you get the app into the app store because you've then got to do all the marketing stuff, but also all the updates every time you know, either you're adding features or changing features or improving things. But every time Apple updates things, you have to update things too. And we've seen recently, you know, there's a sadness around a lot of apps, you know, recently have died off because of iOS 11 updating. And then now, you know, there's a handful of apps, which I really loved. And I, I have to, you know, say to people, you can't use it anymore. Unfortunately, it's died off because the app developers, for whatever reason, have chosen not to update and, and won't be keeping it going. So, yeah. So, it's that ongoing thing. There's just so much work all the time, really. There is. And, you know, I don't want to be too negative. The iOS apps we have have been a very important part of our business over the years. And I still in my heart of hearts, they're part, you know, they're a favorite part of what we do because you can do such complex interactivity and you can make something really snazzy and it works fantastically on iPhone and iOS. Um, but I sympathize with the developers who haven't updated for iOS 11 because there can be diminishing returns in the financial sense. And for someone to dedicate themselves to continuing to putting out updates, you have to ask yourself whether it's going to be worthwhile. And certainly for my company, we've had to uh, we've had to sadly acknowledge that the iOS apps, while we're proud of the products, they don't bring in enough money to be the focus of our business going forwards. You know, we want to reach a lot of musicians across a lot of platforms and we want to be able to fund the company to develop those products. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, Sing True, for example, not to blow our own horn, but I think we rank, you know, number one for major singing terms in the app store. If you search for learn to sing or singing or singing tutor, Sing True is going to be up there. And I'm, I'm super proud of that. And it gets great reviews and I'm really happy. But even with all of that happening, it doesn't make all that much money. And, you know, I won't go into details, but it doesn't make enough money for us to say, let's put a developer on this full time and make it the core of our business. Because, you know, people just aren't paying that much for singing apps in the app store. Yeah, yeah. It's such a fine line, I know. And, um, yeah, the gaming ones are sort of the ones where there's a lot more traffic and, and so on. And, you know, Angry Birds is always up there as the shining story of success. And I think that's what a lot of people have in their mind. But, yeah, that's really interesting, I think, Um to know, you know, because ultimately as a business person, you do, you have to kind of focus on what's going to propel you forward. And part of that is also what you like to do and what you want to be the focus of your business too. So um, I'd love to know more about Musical You and why the decision to start that online community? Because like me, it's a, an online membership community where people can sign up and get help. And I, I think it's that I'm guessing it's that personalised help that was one of the focuses um, for starting that community. So tell us some more about that. Sure. So to set the scene, I guess 2015, at that point, we had the range of iOS apps and we had also a range of ebooks and downloadable training albums, all in this area of ear training and helping musicians to learn the inner skills that a lot of them assume they need a gift or talent to learn, such as playing by ear or improvising or even singing in tune. 
And so we had this product range and each product would work pretty well um, in the sense that the customers were very happy and they made some progress. But what we had learned through customer support and our email subscribers and our website visitors was that actually where people tend to struggle with ear training, particularly if they're in that kind of hobbyist self-taught situation where maybe they're having instrument lessons with a teacher, but the teacher isn't really taking on that ear training side of things, was that they really had trouble maintaining their motivation and their momentum. And if they got stuck on something, they didn't really have anywhere to turn. So they'd have great success with one of our products, but then, you know, six weeks later, they wouldn't be doing anything for their ears. And so Musical U really came out of two driving factors. One was we had a bunch of products and it wasn't always easy for people to figure out what was the best one for them. And the other thing was we knew we wanted to provide more ongoing support and guidance because they needed help figuring out, you know, what am I actually trying to achieve? What are the steps that are going to get me there? What are the resources I can draw on along the way? And they needed help after that to follow through on that plan. And if they got stuck on something, have someone they could reach out to for help and guidance. Yeah, that's great. I think with ear training, uh, it's one of those things where if you don't know what you need help with, you don't know what to look for or where to look. And often terminology gets in the way too. I think, you know, as musicians, we know we know what people would need help with. But um, the, the hobbyist, like you said, is having a bit more trouble trying to find, you know, what it is that they need to work on. They may not even know themselves. So that's really interesting. Mm-hmm. And so um, do they get – is there a chance for people to um, – like do, do you do they ever give you uh, information via recordings inside the community which then someone listens to? Um, I'm thinking, you know, singing intervals or, or um, I, I can't even think what else – what other examples there might be. But do, is there that sort of back and forth interaction that way? We're getting there. Yeah. Uh, So for example, yes, if they're learning to sing in tune, we can do a bit of feedback on a recording or if they are trying to improvise, they can share their recording and get feedback on, on how that's going. Up until now, it hasn't been the major thing just because in general, there's a lot of legwork to do before you get to that stage. Um, So if we put the singing aside for a moment, because that is something where you're going to make a sound and need feedback on that sound. Apart from that, if we're talking about, you know, recognizing chord progressions or recognizing intervals or learning sulfur or applying that to playing by ear, that's actually all stuff that is very well suited to self-study. And if you have the right resources in terms of an interactive app or some training MP3s, you can do daily practice and make very rapid progress with a bit of guidance and with a bit of support. Yeah. And so up until now, you know, the resources we've been focusing on are things where people can come to Musical U and just kind of get on with it. And when they need help, we're there. But it doesn't require that kind of live tuition in the way that instrument skills do or or singing or um, kind of songwriting, I guess, would require feedback on. Yeah, that's really great. Yeah. I like the self-serve type thing. Um, and I think it, it's good because, you know, so, of, so many of us are in different time zones and, and that sort of thing and that can be harder to manage when this episode got, of um, the music like tech teacher podcast the rest is brought of my to you by the midnight music like community in the and you know the midnight music Australia community too, and even is an online space for music zones, teachers who'd like help using technology in their music their lessons sort of really there are community. online courses video tutorials lesson plans music tech news and professional development certificates are provided for any training that you undertake I'm inside the community every day, personally answering members' questions and sharing tips and ideas. The best thing is that you get to connect with hundreds of other music teachers just like you and share your own experiences and occasional music tech frustrations. For more information and a special joining price just for the listeners of this podcast, visit midnightmusic.com.au forward slash podcast offer. That's midnightmusic.com.au forward slash podcast offer. You've got a, a range of experts also part of the community too that help out people. I, I was checking out, you know, some of what you're doing in there and um, I know you've got, say, Sarah. It's Sarah Campbell, isn't it, of the piano mm-hmm. side of things and um, she's fabulous online. I've seen her do her live videos on Facebook. She's really great and very vibrant and engaging. And But you've got some other experts too. We do. So this is our what we call our instrument packs 
membership option and this is for guitar bass piano and singing so for singing we have claire wheeler um who is one of the swingle singers yes, uh, internationally famous acapella yeah. group um for bass we have steve lawson who to me is just the epitome of improvisation and musicality on bass for guitar we have dylan welsh who's a fantastic up-and-coming seattle guitar player who has real insights on the ear training side of guitar playing and as you said, piano, we have Sarah Campbell, who is just phenomenal and really terrific at breaking down these kinds of abstract skills like playing by ear and showing you how to actually do it on the keyboard. And so this is something that we have always wanted to do, but is just this year that we added the feature. And, uh, you know, before that, we had an expert team in place to help with the ear training stuff, but we were quite careful not to go into the instrument specifics because so much of the training we provide is kind of instrument agnostic you know if you want to learn to recognize chord progressions it doesn't matter what instrument you play really as long as you know how to play chords on that instrument you're going to be able to apply it yeah and so all of our core training is really something that works for any instrument at the same time what we were hearing increasingly from members was okay great i'm learning how to do this i know i can recognize it now i'm sitting down with my guitar or my piano what do i actually do <laughs> <laughs> and so um in i think april of this year we launched our instrument packs with those four resident pros and they've been putting out monthly tutorials for us on particular topics like 145 chord progressions or the major pentatonic and helping our members to apply that directly on their instrument yeah, that's excellent. I think it's really funny, isn't it? Because I think it's such an untapped part of learning an instrument. I mean, I'm I'm a very stereotypical um, case of classical musician, learnt to read music, you know, really well and quite happy sitting in front of a, a lead sheet or a chord chart or, a, you know, a fully written notation and, and sight reading and that sort of thing. But Often that improvisation side of things, that's that's the lack of the classical musician. That's often the, the fear area because we were just never brought up doing that that sort of thing along. And I, I feel like, you know, over time I ended up learning to play from chord charts and things, which also some people are not comfortable with at all. And then I, I found that it was it was so much easier if you particularly pop jazz kind of repertoire the shorthand of a chord chart is much easier to read in one page than having seven or ten pages of, you know, a full song written out. And so I kind of developed that myself over time and no one, I don't know, there's not sort of a formal approach to learning about that thing. And, and I think, yeah, I think, I think for a lot of people they need more of that and the ear training side too, just generally um, developing inner hearing and, and that side of thing. And Growing up, I found that I, I love transcribing music. I love listening to recordings and writing them down. And I found I, I could do that, you know, quite early on. And people would sort of go, why, what on earth would you want to do that? And why do you, how do you do that anyway? <laughs> but to me, it was like a puzzle, you know, doing a, a some sort of puzzle, which I also like. And listening to the recording and picking out the separate parts of a cappella recordings and, and so on to, in order to write them down so that a group I was in could sing them. And, and I just found that really a lot of fun. And it, it definitely developed over time. I could see it getting more easy. And even if I don't do it for a while and then try and go back to it, I find I need to sort of catch up my skills again. It's a bit like when you exercise and, you know, you may have done some some strength training a, a while ago, then you leave it for a bit and then it drops off and then you, you've got to kind of catch up again. And all of that side of things is just, it's not a big focus of so many music lessons, I think, growing up and for anyone. Mate, I don't know if things have changed now. Do you think it's changed now just generally or...? I think things are moving in the right direction. You know, I, I think I mentioned before, ear training was a late discovery for me. And like yourself, I had the kind of classical music background. I learned several instruments to a decent standard and I considered myself a capable musician in terms of passing exams. But if you put a chord chart in front of me or if you asked me to improvise, I was totally out of my depth and felt very intimidated and inadequate. And it wasn't until my early 20s that I discovered there was this thing called ear training and it could give me that instinctive understanding of what I heard that I had always assumed was just something other musicians had and I didn't have. And so that's that's what got me so passionate about that area was it unlocked this whole world of music that I had felt incapable of 
in terms of expressing myself, creating, you know, feeling confident. And I just, I wanted to find better ways to share that with more people. Yeah, yeah. I get passionate like that about it too, because I think um, lots of people say to me, oh, it was, it's your natural inbuilt skill because you grew up as a musician. Both my parents were music teachers and we had music all the time, but I don't agree. I think it was a practice skill and, and I was lucky enough to practice it from a very early age because it was around me all the time. But I, I definitely definitely think you can start practicing it and it's that consistency thing it's doing it you know every week or every day or you know as much as you can and it doesn't even need to be a long time each each session either just a little bit all the time will get you so much progress in the area absolutely you know when i talked about helping our students or our members and supporting them and guiding them often part of that is helping them figure out how can they fit this into a busy life Because the vast majority of our members, they're adults. It's a hobby for them. They have very limited time for their music in general, let alone this subset, which is ear training or developing the inner skills. And so we've come up with a a range of suggestions and strategies they can use that help them fit in those mini sessions. Because like you say, it's a lot better with this kind of thing to do a little bit each day than to do it once a month and hope that will serve the purpose. Yeah, yeah. So tell us about that. I know, um, you know you've got some practical approaches to, to doing that. So um, in terms of that, that aspect, fitting it in each day, what are some sorts of things um, you know, that anybody could do to get a bit of ear training into their life? Mm. So I think probably the first thing to say is just to come back to what you were saying about often the terminology being a sticking point. And unfortunately, ear training, particularly in the classical world, is often taught as an adjunct to music theory. And people think of it as just very abstract and boring. And there's a lot of terminology and syntax and, you know, almost mathematics to understand before you can get into the ear training. And so the first thing to understand is just that's not necessary. You know, ear training can be very natural and relaxed and fun like music is. And so the first thing we try and do is just make sure our members understand What are they actually trying to achieve? So that might be, I want to get good enough at playing by ear so that I can go to my local blues jam and sit in confidently. It might be, I know I need to tighten up my rhythm because I joined a band and they tell me my timing's off. (laughs) And so we, we try and get them in touch with what's actually bringing them to ear training. It's not, I'll do this for the sake of it. It's not, I should study music theory. It should be something that they're actually passionate about accomplishing. And that needs to come before any of the practicalities of what app will you use or when will you do your practice? Because otherwise, inevitably, after a few weeks, however, you know, optimistic they were at the beginning, unless it's tied to something they genuinely care about in music, it's just going to fizzle out. So we do a lot around that kind of self uh, self analysis is putting it too strongly, but just, you know, taking five or 10 minutes to think through what are you working towards and then putting a plan in place to get them there. And at that point, it's you're starting to talk about the day-to-day and how can you fit in more music practice. And one thing we we really try and facilitate is fitting it in, not just at the end of the day when you carve out your 30 minutes of music practice time. That's great. And by all means, do use that time partly for ear training. But the beautiful thing about the world we live in these days is that we all have these smartphones or tablets or laptop computers with us most of the time. And ear training is definitely something you can do on the go whenever you have five minutes to spare. So compared with, say, perfecting your piano technique on your repertoire, where you probably need to be sat at a keyboard to do it, (laughs) ear training is something with a pair of headphones or maybe not even that you can improve whenever you have the time. So to get concrete, um, you know, we talked about the interactive iOS apps that my company makes. There's a whole bunch of great ear training apps. And the only caveat I'd throw in is don't pick an app and then feel obliged to follow everything that app gives you. You want to start from what you actually care about and then find apps that are going to serve that purpose. So that said, there's a, a couple that my company don't make that I definitely recommend, like Teoria or uh, Theta Music Trainer that are fantastic. They're interactive. You know you're making progress because you're you know, passing quizzes or completing games. But actually, even before you get into interactive apps, MP3s can be a great option. So for example, we have free MP3s on our website to download that can help you with interval recognition, learning to recognize major versus minor versus augmented versus diminished triads. They can help you recognize one, four, five chord progressions. All of these core skills, you can literally just listen while you're doing the washing up and (laughs) you can make progress. So those are great options. The, The kind of bigger picture of it, though, I guess, is 
I love to encourage people to start from what they're trying to learn and then find the resources to help them get there rather than looking at what's available and figuring out from there what they can learn, if that makes sense. So for example, one of my favorite apps is Virtuoso Piano for iOS. It's, it's just a piano keyboard on your iPhone. But with the kind of exercises we recommend for interval recognition or sulfur, you're kind of humming things or you're singing things and to have a keyboard on hand that you can just kind of check something with. Or if you hear something on the radio and you're like, oh, that sounded like a, a 541 progression there at the start of the song, to be able to whip out your iPhone and just check, okay, well, if I was in C major, was that GFC and, and know whether you were right or wrong. That simple thing of having a keyboard on hand means anything you hear in the real world can be an opportunity for ear training as long as you have those fundamentals of what am I trying to accomplish and do I understand the basic concepts I'm working with? Yeah, that's really great. Yeah, it's really good. The, um, the listening, um, you know, listening to, to your normal regular music and um, putting that filter on of ear training at the same time. I, I think that's something that I've done for a long time. You know, I, I often listen to, say, pop songs on the radio and I kind of just – recite the chord changes in my head you know what what was the sequence or oh can't quite work that one out you know it's always exciting I think when you hear a pop song which has an unusual chord in it because it pretty much is one four five and the odd six you know and then sometimes there'll be like a an unusual one it's like oh my gosh a pop song with a bit of you know interesting (laughs) interesting harmony it's a good thing (laughs) but listening as you go around and and I find even my kids do that I haven't consciously told them to do that but I remember in the car one time I looked over at my my eldest son and I can't remember what song we were listening to. I think it was uh, maybe a Megan Trainer song and it's got sort of a piano part in there and there's like these repeated chords or something. And it's really weird because when I listen to uh, any song, I'm always picking out all the different parts and I, I can sort of know it's a funky bass line and there's a keyboard in there and maybe I know all of the instruments in my head. For some reason, this part hadn't not been really conscious to me you know I wasn't listening and picking out the piano part consciously in my head but my son he's miming the piano part as we're driving along and I sort of went oh yeah yeah that piano part's really cool (laughs) and I thought this is good he's doing it now as well he's actually picking out specific instruments and my younger son does it too he picks out you know little vocal nuances that singers will do and and all sorts of things and I think that's the skill is listening to very specific things in a recording, not just letting it wash over you. It's picking out separate line, instrumental parts and it's picking out little, um, I don't know, separate sections of a song even form-wise and, and noticing that. It's such Absolutely. a great thing to do. It's a lot of fun, I think, you know. Uh, sometimes I'm, if I'm ever doing an arrangement for a song, I do so much listening to the song first before I even go near Sibelius where I would do the arrangement or even manuscript paper. I do so much listening about, you know, what's the form of the song doing and, um, oh, there's this nice little inner part. I might use that somehow in my arrangement or I think I'll change this bit. And, and so much listening goes on first and I think that's a, a great approach to take. Absolutely. You know, at Musical U, we talk about that as active listening. And some people describe it as listening, not just hearing. Yeah, because yeah, a lot yeah. of us in our day to day, you know, we might be complaining about the fact that we don't have enough time to fit in ear training too. But the reality is you probably hear 17 different songs just in the course of your day to day life. And even if you've done no ear training, even if you don't yet know what a one four five chord progression is, for example, you can still use that as an opportunity to improve your ears. And it's exactly what you just described, Katie. It's, can I pick this apart in my mind? Yeah. And that's so valuable, you know, whether you're trying to figure out, okay, what's the bass doing or how many instruments are there or what's the drummer doing and how is it different to what the vocalist is doing? Even those simple questions, it awakes your ear or it awakens your ear in a way that is critical for becoming a good musician and that can come out through your playing it can come out through your ear training it can come out through your composing and your improvisation but like you said you know step one is just am I actually paying attention am I listening and am I able to understand in my mind what is happening when I hear this music it's really funny I have a very funny story actually which is a bit um a bit weird I think it makes me sound a bit weird but someone once said to me their version of torture would be to be stuck in a room where the same song is playing over and over and over and they have no control and they're kind of just like stuck there for ages and ages, I don't know, days, whatever. And I thought, 
You know what? I don't think it would really bother me as much as that because I think every time I listen to the song, I would be picking out different parts and I'd learn the bass line the first time and then maybe the keyboard part the second time. <laughs> By the time I left the room, I'd be able to write it out or play it or whatever. And yeah, it's that sort of thing of, of picking out all the different parts. I love I love to do that. I think it's a great, a great way to approach listening to music. And I think part mm. of it is also I find um, – you need to remember to do that. So you need to have prompts around you in some way to remind yourself, oh, yeah, don't forget to listen actively to this song. You know, in, in my life, you know, when I'm trying to do anything, uh, for instance, to be more productive, often I have maybe 10 minutes where I'm sitting waiting in a queue and I often try and use that time to write a blog post or outline some sort of course, you know, thing that I'm putting together for members of my community. And you can always use those little pockets of time, but you actually have to have in your head, what are the list of two or three things that I might do during that time so that when it comes up, you go, oh yeah, I'm going to do this right now. Otherwise the 10 minutes just goes and it's all over. So it's probably also about for you training that same sort of thing, having some sort of prompt around you or a mental list in your head. Okay, when I've got this time, I can do this specific activity or this listening exercise. Yeah, I think it comes back a little bit to that question of why are you doing it? Because, you know, with our members, for example, if they know their goal is to play chords by ear and they've done a little bit of training for that, then very obviously any song they listen to is an opportunity to try and play around with that. And, you know, even if they can't yet identify the chords, they can say, OK, it's it's the same chords repeating. So I know it goes chord A, chord B, chord A, chord B and that kind of thing, whether or not they know what those chords are. Yeah. And I think having that clarity about what you're trying to achieve makes it a lot easier to spot those opportunities. And the more you do it, the more your ear wakes up and it finds what you're looking for. And, you know, that's just a beautiful complement to the kind of dedicated ear training exercises that are building your core skills. It's taking it out into the real world and using all the music you hear or the music you play as an opportunity to develop your ear further. Yeah, and a great thing to do when you're watching live musicians as well and, um, you know, you've got the visual aspect too, then you can sort of see things as well as hear things. But, yeah, so much fun, so much fun. I love the ear training aspect. I, I, I thought it was funny when I first started university. I went along and in first year, you know, I kind of got there thinking, wow, everyone's going to be really awesome with ear training and it just wasn't the case. I started my course and very quickly found that, most of the musicians doing the course were very intimidated by ear training and their skills were not, they just weren't there because, you know, their teachers over the years, it wasn't a big focus of it. And I think, like you said, it was always that last minute. I, I don't know, our, our Australian exam system here, you know, often you're doing the exam and you prepare all the repertoire and then at the last minute the teacher says, oh, we better do some work on the ear training exercises that you're going to be tested on in the last five minutes of the exam. And it's like, it's like you can't cram for that stuff, you know. There's no, there's no option to cram. So you need to be doing that for years. And it's really the teachers, um, you know, it's the impetus is on the teacher to make sure it's included all along. And so many just, when I was growing up, so many weren't doing that. And I was very lucky because I had it as part of my life anyway. But that was the shock to me, starting university and finding, oh, my God, gosh, there's, most of these people are not comfortable with ear training. And I just thought everybody would be really good at it. <laughs> really good. I, I think maybe the bigger shock, and I don't know if this matches with your own experience, but what I've found talking to musicians, including professional musicians and tons who've done a conservatory qualification or a music degree is that unfortunately, even by the end of that university course, a lot of people are not very good at ear training yeah. and it tends to be one of the least liked courses. And that, that was really tough for us when I was starting the company was to discover that most musicians hadn't heard of ear training. And so we had to explain what it was. <laughs> and the musicians who had heard of ear training generally hated it because they'd had such a dry music theory oriented crash course experience that didn't give them the opportunity to A, see why it was useful or B, develop their skills over time in the way you need to. And so, you know, you were asking before, is it getting any better or is it any different now? I think it is getting better, but I think unfortunately there's still a lot of what you described, which is we'll just tack it on at the end. And then the one experience or the one opportunity musicians have to experience ear training is a very negative one. 
So I, I'm encouraged to see, you know, there are exam boards, for example, now that focus more on the creativity and the improvisation, like Rock School in the UK is doing a pretty good job of bringing that into the syllabus. And more so than that, I think just the availability of online resources has really tra- transformed things. I was going to say that too. And, um, you know, you mentioned theatre uh, trainer and th- mm. their stuff's very gamified. And I know you're a big fan of gamification too. And and um, they have sort of, you know, nice uh, graphic interface. So it feels fun, even if it's really the same stuff that you're doing and you have been doing all along. It kind of feels a bit more fun. I laugh because they've, um, they've got this, uh, you've probably seen it, there's a little tuning um, you can practice yeah, the tuning. Dango brothers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it just cracks me up. It, it sounds terrible. I have to turn it off if I show it in a workshop. I can't show it for too long because people start going insane. <laughs> you know, it, it basically gives you um, uh, two two little emoji faces almost. And, you know, the, the one on the left is the pitch and the one on the right, you need to match it to the one on the left. And, and the faces sort of, ch- anyway, it, it's very funny. It, it's just, yeah, it kind of makes it a bit more fun and, um and, and that's another thing people need practice at is things like learning how to tune and um, recognising that a pitch is in tune or needs adjusting and which way does it need adjusting, flat or sharp. And, yeah, that, it's, it's just really interesting. But, yeah, I think the online thing and apps and stuff, it's just made it a little bit more accessible. There was always that time where you needed someone to play the examples for you in person almost and it's difficult to – find someone to do that you know when you need it and especially if you want to do it every day and so the the you know coming along with apps and um, online online resources that allow you to do that is so much better I actually have a, a friend who's a music teacher and I remember back in the day not really back in the day it was like 2010 or so probably um, it was the time maybe before that the time when iPods were around and she was teaching in a school where um, lots of kids had iPods and she ended up making herself MP3 recordings of different things that they were working on, intervals and, and so on. And she allowed them to take the recordings home on their iPod. And she said the increase in their skill level for ear training just went up so much because they were just doing it on the train, on the way home or on the bus or walking or anything. All of the kids had some sort of travel time to and from school. And she said there's far more um, better results that year than ever before. And that was before the days even of all these great apps that were around. So she did really well, I thought. Yeah, well, I think there's probably three things to it. One is the technology and that we can at this point make it fun and gamified and interactive and provide a very enjoyable experience compared with just dull repetitive drills. The second is availability or accessibility, the fact that you can have it in your pocket and do it whenever you like rather than requiring a live in-person lesson. And the third, I think, is just the breadth of exposure we get these days, you know, with the internet. And, you know, if you go to a site like YouTube, you're not just getting the classical ABRSM perspective on what ear training is or how to become a good musician. You get exposed to ideas from all around the world and all different perspectives. And the reality is there have always been musicians who are very good at the ear side of things. And, you know, gospel music is a great example of that, where the assumption is you'll just turn up and you'll learn it by ear in a lot of cases. And I think it's fantastic now that musicians get a glimpse of that and realize, oh, okay, maybe you can learn to play by ear and maybe it doesn't have to be super boring the way it seemed in my theory course that I took one time, you know? So I I think it's those three things. It's technology making it super fun and interactive. It's that it's accessible and available at all times and that it's, we get a breadth of exposure to how it can be done and how it can be enjoyable that, I don't know, for me growing up, I certainly didn't have access to. I agree too, yeah. And I think, yeah, just the accessibility. It's it's an amazing world we live in, you know, the technology these days. It's just so great. So to have that there is... I, th- I think it's just got to help people out there generally. And tell us about the audience that, um, you know, the people who are part of your community, is it mostly, um, say, adult hobbyist uh, type musicians? It is. So we we certainly reach a lot of music teachers too, because as, as we've talked about, that is an area where a lot of teachers feel their own skills aren't necessarily up to scratch and they don't necessarily have the resources to help their students with uh, inner skills and the ear training we certainly have a lot of professionals and again as we touched on you know even pro musicians don't always have a good ear and are often very self-conscious and a bit disappointed in themselves that they don't have a good ear and so it's great to be able to fill in that gap for them 
but I'd say at least two thirds of our audience and certainly two thirds of our members at Musical U are kind of 30 to 80 year old passionate amateur musicians they're people for whom it's a hobby maybe they're playing in a band maybe they're just getting started but they are not full-time with it they don't have a career to devote to it it is just something they do because they love it and it's a real honor and a privilege that we're able to step in and help them with this side of things that can make it so rewarding and fulfilling compared with just learning the instrument technique which for a lot of people is the default you must get a lot of nice success stories in there i'm guessing people who've come back from a gig and said yeah i I managed to play a solo for the first time or or something like that. We do. So, you know, you mentioned it being a community website and community is a big part of what we do. You know, when I talked about providing support and guidance, that happens in community forums where we're always encouraging our members and helping them with whatever they're facing. And the upshot is they're not just posting, you know, how can I get round major and minor thirds that I'm struggling with? They're also posting, oh, my gosh, I heard a song on the radio today and I just knew what the chords were. <laughs> or like you said, you know, I, I went to band practice and I was able to actually contribute to the discussion of what this section of the song should be like because I, I finally understood what all those words meant. And so it's fantastic. It's so much fun for our team to see those little wins. And we periodically, you know, when a member is particularly triumphing, uh, we love to invite them to do a member spotlight and so we have a handful of those on our website now where someone just tells their story you know this is where I was this is what I needed to learn and through the training at Musical U and the help I got there this is what I've been able to accomplish and uh, you know you're a teacher yourself you know how rewarding it is to see the results of your effort in that way and how you can contribute to someone else's musical life. So, yeah, it's a fantastic thing to see. Yeah, I have that all the time too. And um, I love just hearing little anecdotal things. Um, I try and encourage people, you know, share share things that are working, you know, things that you've tried, just small things. And it's just really nice when you get that little feedback. And I love, you know, in my own community, I get people saying, oh, my gosh, I ran a technology-based lesson on the iPad and it was brilliant and the kids loved it and they were super engaged and I never thought that the blues would be so much fun <laughs> so that sort of thing and it's just really nice when you get those um, little comments and I know like for me it keeps me going because a lot of the time when you're running these online businesses you feel like you're kind of working in the dark a little bit and um, you don't have that day-to-day contact with people I, I really like to still get out and run workshops in person because otherwise you can spend the whole time just sitting in front of a computer and even though you're talking to people in adverted commas in chat, you know, and, and messaging and stuff like that, it's it's not quite the same as seeing the reaction face to face. And yeah, I think it's it's really good to get that feedback from time to time. It's enormously valuable. And, you know, up until we launched Musical U, we would we'd get those kind of milestone triumph stories someone would you know send our support email a message saying they'd had this great success with our ebook or our album and we'd get reviews in the app store that would give me some insight to how it was helping people but with musical you i think it's exactly what you just said which is it can be the day-to-day that's so rewarding you know it's not just this amazing moment at band practice it's the fact that every day for the last three weeks i showed up i did my training i could see concrete progress and that is enormously useful for our members because it gives them that momentum it gives them that sense of accomplishment and achievement and it keeps them on the right path and it's it's so rewarding for our team too because even if it's not yet culminating in one of those big triumphant moments we can see you know this stuff is working it's helping people and they're coming back day by day and they're seeing the progress and yeah that definitely helps us stay just passionate and enthusiastic about continuing to improve the product yeah it's so great so great well i think what you're doing is really good and um it's just nice to see i think you know the focus on the ear training side of things and it's something that i've been passionate about all along as well and and i can see the fear and intimidation in people who who even come to um you know when i'm running workshops i often get people People involved and we do it's kind of like we are the class you know when I'm showing something they become the students in the class and and I've learned over time to actually not ever put people on the spot with um, something where you know I might say clap the rhythm that you see on the board or whatever it is I, I actually rarely put people on the spot in my sessions to do that because I know that so many I, I can't pick out who's going to be good or bad at the, the task and 
I don't want to professionally embarrass anyone because it's a whole group of teachers. <laughs> so, so I, you know, I've learned that it. we'll all do it as a group. Let's all, you know, this side of the room, everybody do it together. And you, I think it's it's not good that, that the teachers are sort of intimidated by it. And, um, yeah, I feel like it's something that, that everybody could work on. So it's good to hear that you've got teachers in your community too who are Absolutely. getting some benefit from it as well. It's, it's probably like secret training for them, you know, just secretly go in there and brush up my skills and um, – you know, don't tell anyone else about it. <laughs> sure. I, I think it's funny when you frame it as ear training, and this is part of the reason, you know, we really rebranded a couple of years ago from easy ear training to musical you, because when you frame it as ear training, it seems like this little box and I will do this beside my music theory. And that's a small thing compared to my instrument practice. And the reality is the reason I think people are so sheepish and self-confident, whether they're a professional or a music teacher, even is it cuts really to the heart of who we are as a musician. You know, we want to express ourselves. We want to be confident and play freely and have no qualms about standing up in front of a room and doing our thing. But any sense of a lack of our inner skills and our, you know, musicality, it, it really cuts to the heart of who we are. And it means if you haven't done this work, if you haven't spent the time training and put those skills in place, you're always going to have that kind of nervousness around this area and and so it can it can just be so empowering and rewarding whether you're a passionate amateur or a teacher or a professional to learn some of these skills that are absolutely learnable and can be quite enjoyable these days to learn it can be so transformative for a musician so yeah it, it's wonderful to see so for anyone who wants to um, take a look at musical you just uh, tell us the web tell everybody the website because i know there's a u the u is a u not a y-o-u yes um so it is musical dash you.com where that's the letter you and actually since you're all podcast listeners i would love for you to check out our podcast which covers all of this kind of stuff yes which we didn't even the, mention that oh, oh yes well it's a it's a new project for us it's called the musicality podcast and you can find that at musicalitypodcast.com yeah and, and really do go and check that podcast out it's great i know you um talk to people and i think you've got sort of alternating uh, episodes haven't you where there's someone who shares uh, something like an expert and then there's like a teaching kind of episode in between times and you know i've been listening to some of those and it's really great always good to see more music education based podcasts come on the scene i think it's a a, a growing area now which is a nice thing Mm. And, you know, this is another great way to fit a bit more training into your busy day. You know, if you're listening to a podcast on the way to work, it can actually be enhancing your musical abilities. Yeah. So, yeah, like you say, we're doing interviews with fantastic folks. And what I love most, I think, is that we don't just ask them to come on and teach. We also dig a bit into their own musical background. And I think it can be really enlightening and reassuring for people to hear that even these amazing musicians and music educators didn't necessarily find it all came easy. And a lot of them have had to put in time to learn these skills of creativity and expression in music. So um, yeah, I, I'm really, I'm excited about what we're doing there just to kind of pull the curtain back and show that this stuff is learnable and the people who are best at it have learned it. Yes, yes. Fantastic point. Fantastic point. Thanks so much for chatting to us today. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what comes next with Musical You and staying in touch. It's great to talk to someone else who's got the, the similar sort of online business thing too. So thanks Thank so, much, so much, Christopher. It's been such a pleasure, Katie. And, you know, I've been following Midnight Music for so long now. It's, it's such a pleasure to get the chance to talk live. Yeah, and really I'm good. delighted to be on your show. I love it too. Thank I you. get to pick all the people I get to talk, you know, I want to talk to. So it's a really nice thing for me too. <laughs> all right. Thanks and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. You too. If you enjoyed this episode of the Music Tech Teacher podcast, I'd love to invite you to come and take a look at my Midnight Music community. It's an online professional development space for music teachers just like you who want to learn practical tips for using technology in music education. For more information about the community and a special offer for podcast listeners, go to midnightmusic.com.au forward slash podcast offer. The Music Tech Teacher podcast is hosted by me, Katie Wardrobe. You can find more information and links from today's episode at midnightmusic.com.au forward slash 41. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next time. <laughs>